In this video we're going to take a look at the new Tri Hatmi room looking at Pwnkit or CVE 2021-4034. So this is a newly discovered local privilege escalation vulnerability which is very easy to exploit and as of a day or two ago was present in nearly every Linux distribution uh, as of the last 12 years or so. So let's get started anyway. We can use an attack box here which is kind of like a virtual machine in your browser to access the the box. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to start the root start the machine and wait for it to boot up. You can see I'm connected to the VPN already so that's how I'm going to access the system. We can check ifconfig if you're using the VPN and make sure that you are connected that you do have an IP address on the TriHackMe network and then we just need to wait for this to boot up so it takes a minute for the IP address to show but let's get started with some of the information here anyway. So the first section is called Introduction and Deploy and it says CVE 2021-4034 of Pwnkit is a terrifying local privilege escalation vulnerability located in the Polkit package installed by default on almost every major distribution of Linux as well as other Nix operating systems. In other words, it affects virtually every mainstream Linux system on the planet. This room will try to provide an overview of the vulnerability as well as recommendations to patch affected systems. A vulnerable machine has also been attached to allow you to try out the vulnerability for yourself. So let's begin. We can just hit complete for this first part and let's jump on to the tutorial part. You can see we've got an IP address now. And on to the background section. So Punkit was discovered by researchers at Qualys and announced in January 2022, I think it was the 25th. And the technical security advisory for this vulnerability can be found here. So we can go and take a look at that. This is just in a text file so there is actually a blog post out by them which we'll, we'll bring up shortly but you can take a look at that. The vulnerability has existed in every version of the policy toolkit or polkit since it was first released in 2009 and allows any unprivileged attacker to easily obtain full administrative access over any Linux machine with a polkit package installed. Unfortunately polkit is installed by default on most distributions of Linux making the vulnerability extremely widespread. The ease of exploitation and ubiquitous nature of Polkit makes this an absolutely devastating vulnerability. However, fortunately it is not exploitable remotely, making Pwnkit purely a local privilege escalation vulnerability. So before we jump into the vulnerability, what is Polkit? Polkit is part of the Linux authorization system. In effect, when you try to perform an action which requires a higher level of privileges, Polkit can be used to determine whether you have the requisite permissions. It is integrated with SystemMD and is much more configurable than the traditional pseudo system. Indeed, it is sometimes referred to as the pseudo of system D, providing a granular system with which to assign permissions to users. When interacting with Polkit, we can use the pkexec utility. It's this program that contains the vulnerability. And an example of using the utility, we can try to run user add command through pkexec. In the GUI session results in a pop-up asking for credentials. Let's take a copy of this. Let's go to the terminal. And you can see it asks us for a password, so it wants to get a higher level of privileges in order to add this user. Let's hit cancel. You can see that also if this is just in a text-based prompt, you'll see that in the terminal. So to summarize, the policy toolkit can be thought of as a fine-grained alternative to a simpler pseudo system that you may already be familiar with. And now on to the vulnerability. So as was mentioned previously, the Pwnkit vulnerability exists in the pkexec utility, the primary front end to the Polkit system. We won't go into too much detail here in the interest of readability. However, we encourage you to read through the security advisory, which we just opened up, for a full technical explanation of the vulnerability. The short version is this. Versions of pkexec released prior to the patch don't handle command line arguments safely, which leads to an out-of-bounds write vulnerability, allowing an attacker to manipulate the environment with which pkexec is run. This is all you really need to know, but for a slightly more technical explanation, read on. So more specifically, pkexec attempts to pass any command line arguments that we pass to it using a for loop, starting off at an index of 1 to offset the name of the program and obtain the first real argument. So if we entered pkexec bash, then pkexec is the program name and the argument would be 0. The actual command line arguments start at the index 1. The name of the program is irrelevant to argument parsing, so the index is simply offset to ignore it. What happens then if we don't provide any arguments? The index is permanently set to 1. So here's some code here as an example. You can see we have a for loop starting at n equals 1. And while n is less than the number of arguments, we're going to get n plus plus. If the number of arguments is 0, then n is always going to be less than the number of arguments. So whatever happens inside this loop is basically going to be skipped. This becomes a problem later when pkexec attempts to write to the value of the argument at the index n, as there is no command line arguments and there is no argument at index n. Instead, the program overwrites the next thing in memory, 
which just so happens to be the first value in the list of environment variables when the program is called using the C function called execve. In other words, by passing pkexec to a, a null list of arguments, we can force it to overwrite an environment variable instead. For context, certain dangerous environment variables are removed by the operating system when you attempt to run a program that has the suid bit set, so set user id, as pkexec does by necessity. This is to prevent attackers from being able to hijack the program as it runs with administrative permissions. Using the out of bounds write, we're able to reintroduce our choice of dangerous environment variables by tricking pkexec into adding it for us. There's a variety of different ways to abuse this, all leading to code execution as the root user. So we're going to go and look at a bit more detail at the vulnerability and the code when we have a look at the blog post. But let's just continue for now. So is PwnKit exploitable remotely? Yes or no? It's not. It's a local privilege escalation vulnerability. So you already need to have access to the system. You'd already need to have a shell on the system in order to be able to exploit this. And in which PolKit utility does the PwnKit vulnerability reside? That is, of course, the PK exec. Awesome. Okay, let's move on to exploitation. We'll go through the vulnerability in a little bit more detail once we have exploited it or while we're exploiting it. So exploiting PwnKit is very easy. There are numerous exploits online and writing your own is not particularly difficult. So a lot of proof of concepts came out very shortly after this advisory was put out. The version that we're going to be using here is written in C and was released soon after the Qualys security advisory was made public. The repository can be found here. Let's go and take a look at it. And this variation of the exploit makes use of the dangerous gconv path variable to include a malicious shared object file that calls bin sh with root permissions. So as was mentioned, these are the kind of paths that will be stripped from the before the suid binary is called. First, we must connect to the target machine. If you're using an in-browser connection, you'll already have access to your browser. So that's if you're using that attack box, whatever it's called. Otherwise, we need to SSH in. So let's grab this IP address. Let's go ahead and SSH to try hack me at pasting that IP. Yes, for sure. And let's grab the password. I think it's try hack me one, two, three. Paste that in. All right, so we're now connected. We've actually, do we have the file here already? We do, okay. So we can print out that proof of concept, but let's go and take a look at it on GitHub. All it's asking us to do at the moment is compile the exploit and then run it. There's a video as well in case you just want to see it being run. Okay, and then it's asking us to take a read through the exploit. All right, well, let's compile it first of all then. So we can do GCC, taking the input and then dash O for our output. Let's call it exploit. Oh, call it the wrong thing, that's fine. And then let's just try and run an exploit. And very, very quickly, look what we have. It's very clearly a root shell. And now we can go ahead and cut out the flag, which I believe is roots flag.txt. Got no autocomplete now. And there we go. Try hack me. Congratulations, you exploited PwnKit. Let's take a copy of this. Let's submit it here. We don't need to submit anything here for reading through and trying to understand how it works. Bonus question, using the optional advisory and repository link, try to write your own version of the PwnKit exploit. All right, I'm not going to do that. There's quite a few proof of concepts out, but let's go and take a look at this code and also take a look at the blog post. Let me take a copy of the URL. So we've got an introduction here, which is going to cover a lot of the same stuff that we've already looked at. Our potential impacts, so as already mentioned as well, this has been present in the code base since 2009, affects most Linux distributions, and it was disclosed. So they sent off an advisory first of all to get it patched, and then the coordinated release date of this advisory and blog post was the 25th of January. We've got a proof concept video which just shows the exploit being run. And here's the technical details. The beginning of pkexec's main function processes the command line arguments and searches for the program to be executed. If the path is not absolute, it searches for the program in the path environment variable. So we can see the lines here, line 534 to 568, we have this loop, and we know that we should be passing a program to pkexec. We tried doing this as an example with the to add a user. So it's expecting a program to be passed to it, but if we pass a null list, then that's essentially, that's going to be a zero. So what's going to happen here is it's going to say n is equal to one, while n is less than the zero, which is the length of the argument we've passed in, do whatever's in this loop. So it's never actually going to do what's in there. And that means that whenever we get down to the next stage, to 610, it's using argv n, but n, because this loop never was never executed, 
that n is still equal to 1. And that means by the time we get down to 610, we're reading out of bounds to an argument which doesn't exist because we didn't pass any arguments and we're trying to read argument number 1. And then it's going to also do the path check. So it's going to look to see if there's a, a slash in the path. If there isn't, then it's going to call gfindProgrammingPath, which is going to check our environment variable to see what path we have set. And then it's going to write argvn to equal the path. I probably didn't explain that very well. Let's go and have a look through what else it's saying here. This might explain it a little bit better. So as they say here, unfortunately, if the number of command line arguments is zero, which means if the argument list that's been passed to execve is empty, i.e. null, then arg v0 is null. This is the arguments list terminator. Therefore, at line 534, let's scroll back up. So this is our loop. The integer n is permanently set to one. Whenever we get down to 610, it's going to be reading out of bounds from arg v1 because there isn't an arg v1, we didn't pass any arguments. And then at 639, the pointer s is written out of bounds to arg v1. So we're reading from arg v1 and then we're writing to arg v1. The problem is there was no arg v1. So let's see what actually happens. To answer this question, we must digress briefly. When we exec v a new program, the kernel copies our argument environment strings and pointers, argv and envp, to the end of the new program stack. For example, and then we have a diagram here which is showing we run the program, which is argv0. We provide our options as argv1, so that's our list of options. And then however many args we've got following that. In this case, this is all null. So we go straight over to this envp0 and envp1. And you can see then that we can actually provide some values here. So because argv and nv pointers are contiguous in memory, if argc is zero, then the out of bounds argv1 is actually nvp0. So whenever it's trying to read from and write to here, it's actually reading and writing to here. So we control this value at nvp0. And then at line 610, the path of the program to be executed is read out of bounds from argv1, i.e. nvp0, and points to value. At line 632, this path value is passed to gfind program in path because the value does not start with a slash at line 629. So we saw that. So providing this path 0, which is going to be this, doesn't start with a slash, it's going to go to find the path. Then gfind program in path searches for an executable named value in the directories of our path environment variable, which is right here. So if we control both of these, which we do, we control np0 and np1 we can select the value which is going to be the program to execute and then we can also specify the path i.e. the path to look for the program. Finally at line 639 this full path is written out of bounds to argv1 i.e. np0 thus overwriting our first environment variable. So stated more precisely if our path environment variable is path equals name and if the directory name exists in the current working directory and contains an executable file named value then a pointer to the string name value is written out of bounds to np0. If our path is path equals name equals dot, and if the directory name equals dot exists and contains an executable file named value, then a pointer to the string name equals dot slash value is written out of bounds to np0. In other words, this out of bound write allows us to reintroduce an unsecure environment variable, for example, ld preload, into pkexec's environment. These insecure variables are normally removed by ld.so from the environment of SUID programs before the main function is called. We will exploit this powerful primitive in the next section. So there isn't actually a next section. They didn't seem to release a proof of concept as far as I could see. The rest of the blog goes through some remediations and how we can potentially detect it in logs and things like that. So hopefully I explained that okay and got everything right. But let's go and take a look at the exploit code anyway and see what's going on here. So I've seen quite a few different proof of concepts now. This one, you can see we have the shell set as a char pointer at the beginning. And this is basically going to be the malicious program that we want to execute. And in our main function here, you can see that we've got a file pointer set up. It's going to create the directories so that gconv path, it mentioned ld preload here. That's one of the dangerous path environment variables which is removed whenever running an SUID program. Another one is the gconv path. So they're setting that up. You can see that they create this pwn kit, which is later going to be, they're later going to write a pwnkit.c file in that directory. 
and write all of the shell characters to it and it's going to compile that. So that's going to be our exploit essentially. In other words, our value. So if we go back here and have a look, remember we are writing the value here. That's going to be the program to execute. And then we're writing the path here as well. And down here we have our environment variable list, which is being set up. So you can see that it's the binary we're going to execute. It's the path. And then we have some more set up here as well. And then finally, it's, this is where the actual vulnerability is. We're calling PK exec. And instead of providing a program to execute, we're providing a null list, an empty list. So the vulnerability that we just looked at there is going to occur whereby it's going to read out of bounds, it's going to write out of bounds, and ultimately it's going to call this program. One other thing to mention here is it's actually set up to clear the, some of the evidence that the attack took place. So you can see here, when the binary runs, it's actually going to reset the path to its original value. It's going to remove the directories that it set up and the pwnkit binary, and then it's going to call bin sh. So you're getting a root shell, but it's cleaning up most of the, the changes that were made here. Okay, so now that we've had a look at the technical details from the blog and we've reviewed the code of a proof of concept, let's go back and have a look at the remediation section of TryHackMe. So now that we've seen the devastating impact of CV 2021-4034, how can we protect against it? Fortunately, developers tend to be fairly fast when it comes to developing patches to critical vulnerabilities. As a prime example, at the time of writing, Canonical have already released a patch versions of the Polkit package in the APT package manager for all versions of Ubuntu which are not end of life. The patch version can be installed with a simple upgrade so you can just call sudo apt update and upgrade. In the distributions which have not yet released patch versions of the package, the re recommended hotfix is simply to remove the SUID bit from the PK exec binary. So you can just do sudo chmod 0755 on your PK exec. This is far from ideal, however it works as a temporary solution until more distributions start packaging versions of Polkit that are patched against Pwnkit. It should be noted that many variations of Pwnkit exploit using different environment variables and exploiting the vulnerability in different ways. Some of these leave traces and logs behind, others do not. So as we saw, this actually did a bit to clear up some of the changes. I'm not sure whether there'll be some other logs left elsewhere though with this one. You can check to ensure the system is patched by attempting to run a copy of the exploit against it. If it returns the PK exec help menu, then the system is patched. Okay, good to know. That's it, we don't need to answer any questions here. Let's take a look at the conclusion. And there's not really too much to see in the conclusion. We're congratulated for finishing the room and told that we've now got a high level overview. We've exploited a target, we've looked at some remediations and we should now have a working knowledge of the vulnerability. It also recommends another Trihatmi room, which has a similar vulnerability with the Polk, with Polkit anyway, which also led to a local privilege escalation vulnerability. So that's it, we can hit completed, we've finished the room. A couple of other things I'll mention is I saw John Hammond tweeted that he had used curl to pipe this in via a shell script. I also saw that somebody had tweeted to say that they found this vulnerability in 2013. You see here, Ryan Mallon found the vulnerability in 2013, failed to find the avenue for exploitation, but did identify the root cause. And as they said, they found the vulnerability in 2013, they didn't get a working exploit. But it just goes to show you that these vulnerabilities, as well as sitting there for a long time, aren't necessarily hard to exploit or hard to find, and there's probably a lot more vulnerabilities like this out there. But I hope you've enjoyed this video anyway. If you have any questions or comments, any cool tips or tricks for me, let me know in the comments.